right, it is seven o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and begin. Good evening. Uh, we're so glad that you decided to beat the heat and join us this evening for Ask Me Anything, featuring executive chef Tim Fetter. During the program, your mics will be muted. However, you may submit questions to Chef Tim using the chat feature in Zoom. My colleague, Danny Lynn Howard, is assisting us tonight and will be monitoring the chat throughout the program. Danny Lynn, thank you for your assistance this evening. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, I'm pleased to introduce Chef Tim Fetter to you. Chef Fetter is a 2001 graduate of the Culinary Institute of America. He's received numerous honors, including the 2012 Chef of the Year for the American Culinary Federation's Laurel Highlands chapter. He has competed in four ACF Hot Foods competition, competitions, earning one gold, two silver, and one bronze medal. Last year, Chef Tim was named to the Incline's Who's Next list for food and beverage for elevating Pittsburgh's dining scene. When he is not consumed leading Park Parkhurst culinary work on the bluff, Chef Tim serves as the chairman for the board and past president of his chapter. He's recognized as, the, as a certified exe executive chef and certified culinary administrator for the ACF. Chef Tim is also a member of Parkhurst's culinary leadership team and serves on the advisory committee for Westmoreland County Community College's Culinary Arts Program. He's partnered with Greater Latrobe School District and Grow Pittsburgh to provide cooking classes for children. Chef Tim, thank you for all that you do for our community on the bluff, and we're excited to give our alumni a taste of your talent. Let's get started with the first question. Our first question was a pre-submitted question, and it is, what is your go-to easy meal after a busy day? Well, uh, hi everybody. Thanks for the, the wonderful introduction and uh, glad to be with everybody tonight. Um, so my go-to after a busy day, and it's, I wouldn't even just say after a busy day, my go-tos are often the very simple things, the quick and simple things. You know, I'm used to when I'm cooking at work and I have a whole, you know, team of people to, to do the dishes and clean the floors and all those kind of things that you can, you can get a little crazy, uh, but at home, other than my kids who don't necessarily want to actually do those things. Um, uh, you know, they're not there to, to, to clean up as much. So I try to keep it simple. So anything I can do a one pan, you know, like stir fry, something like that, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm all about sheet tray baking. Like if I have a half sheet tray, then I put actually today we had, uh, we had chicken, uh, some chicken breasts that I threw in the, you know, uh, season them up, threw them in the oven. Uh, we had some squash that came out of our garden, threw that in there, and then some marinara, a little bit of cheese on top, and just threw the whole thing right in the oven. Uh, turned out really well. Um, or we have a smoker, and I like doing the same thing out there. If I can just kind of throw, you know, my meat on one side, and uh, a little bit later, maybe some potatoes, and a little bit later, some uh, vegetables. So that way, it's just, you know, all kind of comes off at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the, I, I try to keep it as simple as I can, you know. That makes me feel better about my culinary uh interest always easy <laughs> all right next question do you have any healthy recipe ideas for a plant-based diet so for one it kind of depends on what the, i'm not exactly sure what the the, the submitter uh, meant by that because plant-based diet can, to me can mean two different things and and when i think plant-based generally i think mostly plant-based like mostly things that come from the earth come from plants less on the, the animal product and, and byproduct, but not completely eliminating. But then there's also, that certainly could be considered, um, you know, vegetarian or vegan diets as well. So um, let's see, for one, lean on the nutrient dense stuff. So think about quinoa and legumes and nuts and, you know, and, and in terms of vegetables, you know, they say taste the rainbow because all those colors are all different nutrients, different flavors, different textures usually, uh, and try to incorporate all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I wanted to mention too about um, kind of the impossible burgers, because I know that's kind of their thing is the plant base, you know, and beyond burgers. And there's a lot of different, you know, products coming on the market. And, and I know they're very popular and those places are, are you know, that are selling them or doing them because, uh, you know, they, they sell and they have a, a very good marketing strategy behind them. Um, but I'd say be cautious with that kind of stuff because it's, it's, I don't know, really know what it is. It's not really food. I don't know. I think I'd rather have my meats and vegetables and all those kind of things come from farmers rather than a lab <laughs> or, or chemists that, that create those things. So, uh, and then I've, I've, you know, I've heard a lot that um, a lot of those things can be 
you know, even though they're plant-based, which on the surface might seem like that's great and that's better, uh, they also have a lot of sodium and they're so processed that the actual nutrients aren't really, they're not that great for you. And then the, cal the calories are more than you would even think. It's not that much better than if you just went with, you know, whatever the alternative is for that, that kind of thing. So uh, in terms of specific recipes, I mean, there's, there's tons of stuff that we can share. Um, but, but that's kind of the go-to of, of how do you get the most nutrients, um, and the least bad stuff, you know, the, the fat and the sugars and, and all that kind of stuff and, and using herbs and spices, um, and things like that to really, you know, bring out the dishes without having to add all the, the cheese and, and, and fat and all that kind of stuff. This wasn't actually one of my questions, but because I am interested in plant-based diets, it made me wonder if you had suggestions because you do want to stay away from the processed foods. Um, not everybody who's plant-based avoids the processed foods, but oftentimes that's the case. Do you have recommendations if you are trying to make like a homemade version of the Impossible Burger? Do you have recommendations if it's beans or, or mushroom or what are, what are some good substitutes for, for meat? So yeah, I mean, you named a couple of them, beans and mushrooms for sure. And there's that whole, um, uh, the James Beard Foundation does, I think they do it every year, the, the blended uh, burger project where they're, they're not trying to eliminate meat, but they're trying to say, how do you make, how do you make a burger better? Uh, and usually it's, it's mushrooms is, is, is a good base for that. The only problem with that is there's so much moisture in mushrooms because, you know, especially like button, you know, uh, cremini mushrooms, they're like at least 75% moisture. There's really not that much there. So once you cook that down, it's, it doesn't leave a whole lot left. Uh, but beans for sure. I will say that on campus uh, for the past, uh, I think two, one or two years now, uh, in the incline, uh, formerly, you know, the, the off ramp and the rat skeller and, and all that, uh, we serve a, um, uh, a black bean burger that is completely, completely vegan and basically allergy free. And it has um, black beans and flax seeds and we use rice flour um, and corn. And it has, so it has all kinds of different stuff in there. Uh, and the rice flour and the flax seeds kind of bind everything together and it gives it that, you know, that little bit of that meaty texture. It's not going to be the same as the, as the, you know, the impossible to be on, but uh, it, 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 it certainly is a, is a much better way to mimic uh, a burger without um, having all this kind of weird, you know, stuff go into it. It's all ingredients that we're putting in so we know what it is. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning some of the things our students like as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question was also pre-submitted. What do you think of coconut sugar? I was interested in this because um, I, I don't know anything about coconut sugar. Well, I'll be honest, I, I, before seeing this, I haven't, uh, I haven't done that much research on coconut sugar, um, but I did uh, look into it a little bit and uh, I'm always a little bit leery when some of these, you know, the, these things come out. I know a, a few years ago it was, it was the, um, the coconut oil was like the, the new, thing that would cure every disease in the world and, uh, you know, the best thing for you. But then I, a, a year or two into it, I started to hear, eh, it's not really everything it's cut out to be. So, um, but with coconut sugar, from, from what I found is it, it certainly does contain more nutrients than, than, you know, just granulated sugar. Um, but it's such a marginal, um, you know, kind of variance from the standard that it really isn't that much better. And it's still, uh, it's still sugar. Sugar is sugar, kind of regardless of where it comes from. Yet it might have a, uh, it, it does have a, a lower glycemic in index. So it's going to be a little bit better for you. But I can't say that I've done a whole lot with it um, to to really, you know, say, I, I, I couldn't say if it's, if one-to-one -one ratio works for most recipes, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a ton of information on that one. Okay. Do you have any ideas for easy appetizers? Uh, yeah. So as much as uh, I might not enjoy making them in very mass quantities, uh, one thing that you can do at home very easily is just skewer things, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you know, think of an Italian skewer that has a piece of, you know, salami or pepperoni and fresh mozzarella and basil and tomato and that kind of thing with a little balsamic dressing on it. You know, those might be things that you already have, you know, in, in your, in your fridge anyway, uh, throw them on a skewer, nice, uh, arrange them nicely around a platter and it can be something that's, you know, very simple. You can do ahead of time and, but it's nice. It's a, it's a little different, you know? Um, 
you know, things like bruschetta uh, that you have kind of endless possibilities where you get a nice piece of bread, you know, cut it up, toast it or grill it. Uh, and then you could do your traditional tomato topping. You could do, uh, you know, apples and, and grapes and goat cheese and something like that. Uh, and really the, the, you know, the possibilities really are endless. Um, another, uh, I'll, I'll mention something we do on campus a lot for catering that is very popular and, but super easy, but it's kind of fun is miniature grilled cheese, which we just take, we, for the ones we do most often, we take rye bread, Breadworks rye bread, um, smoked cheddar cheese. Um, sometimes we use Gouda or Swiss, uh, and just do a regular grilled cheese. We'll make them, you know, full size and then, you know, cut the edge off and cut them down into little squares or triangles. And then the, the secret ingredient or the secret uh, that, that makes them really pop is we make red, red onion marmalade to put on top. And it's super easy to make. You just take red onion, slice them down, and just cook them down in a pan with a little bit of sugar and a little bit of red wine vinegar. Uh, and just till they're kind of, kind of syrupy, kind of, you know, kind of gooey until the, the moisture cooks out of them. And we just put that right on top. And, you know, again, it's, it couldn't really be that much easier, but people love whenever we do those. I like it because it sounds very fancy, but you make it seem very doable. Yep. Uh, okay, so this question came in from our chat. Do you have a resource, a website, an app, or a book that you go to for inspiration that you would recommend for a home chef? Hmm. Uh, let's see. So, uh, I mean, the internet nowadays, I mean, it used to be, you know, when I was started coming up in the industry, it was, you know, you can find a little bit of stuff on the internet, but not, nothing like you can today. Yeah. The, only, the, only bad, the only flip side of that is that uh, there's a lot of bad information and bad recipes out there as well. Um, let's see, whenever I go, uh, when I'm trying to find inspiration or try to come up with a menu or change something, I'm, I really rely on photos more than anything. I'm one mm -hmm. of those guys that I, I don't like cookbooks that don't have any pictures, you know? Uh, I like seeing what something looks like and then it, it kind of gets me sparking of, you know, how I can do that. Um, but um, let's see, I'm trying to think of some of the books. A lot of the books that I have are, um, you know, a little bit more geared towards, uh, you know, the professional type stuff. But uh, let's see, there's a, this, this book's, uh, it's probably a, about 20 years old or more. Um, oh, man, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, James, James Peterson or James Patterson is the author. And it's just kind of the basics. And it's really, you know, um, um, pictures and really shows you how to do kind of step-by-step -step stuff at home, you know? Uh, and I will say that one of my, uh, kind of my idols and, and I've actually got to cook for him and meet him is Thomas Keller, who is the chef at the French Laundry. That's where he started. Well, his first restaurant was the French Laundry in, in Youngville, California. And he has Per Se and Bouchon and, you know, a bunch of different other ventures. But he has a few books that are um, kind of designed for at home, like even ad hoc, one of his restaurants, which is a very uh, kind of an elevated home style uh, cuisine where like their famous dish is fried chicken, just kind of that uh, really, you know, uh, he has a, a unique way of doing fried chicken. It's kind of a double, it's, it's brined and then it's dipped in buttermilk and then flour and then back in the buttermilk and back in the flour and then it's fried. Uh, but ad hoc at home is an awesome book. Uh, it doesn't really encompass everything, but it's it's great for that kind of the fun but homey, fancy stuff you can do at home. I'm I'm interested in the fried chicken. Uh, I'm gonna ask Danny. I know another question came in from our chat. Danny Lynn, can you fill us in? Hey, yeah. Um, Anita wanted to know: Have you ever dry aged or wet aged steaks, and what kind of steak do you recommend for aging? Mm. So, let's see. Um, Dry age, I personally have not done much with that because uh, the thing about dry aging is you need to have uh, very specific temperature and humidity levels. So a lot of, a lot of times you don't really have that, uh, you know, we don't have that equipment available uh, at, at, uh, at Duquesne and, and I certainly don't have that uh, at home. Um, so, but however, I mean, dry aged beef is, is uh, you know, some people don't really realize why, why is dry aged beef better? Uh, because you're letting beef sit around, which we're all taught that that's not what you do, right? You eat, you eat stuff whenever it's fresh. Um, well, for one, um, it starts to lose moisture. It starts to dry out. And, the, and, and what that does is concentrate the flavors that are, that are there. And then the enzymes uh, and the proteins start to break down to actually make it more tender, more flavorful. Um, and then uh, in terms of wet aging, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we get in, in you know, commercial food service, uh, you can consider wet aged. 
um, because of how it's packaged uh, and, and it lasts surprisingly long. But I feel that wet aging doesn't, it, it doesn't necessarily develop anything like, uh, like the dry aging does. Uh, but if you have, uh, you know, a farmer or a producer or a butcher that has good dry aged beef, that's, that's where it's at for sure. Great. All right. Let's go back and take another question from our pre-submitted questions. Oh, what rule have you learned that you feel every home chef should know? So uh, let's see. The, the one that I tell people all the time is... Uh, you can always add more, but you can't take it out. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, it go, and it also goes with, uh, with cooking times too. And luckily my, my, I'm looking, my wife's out in our backyard and she can't hear me, but um, my <laughs> wife is good for, you know, cranking things up on high and, and kind of forgetting about them. And I always say that you can always add more time, but you can't take it. Once it's burnt, it is burnt, you know? If you check it and it's, and it's still underdone, you, you got more time to wiggle it there. So um, those are probably two of, you know, kind of the most important, you know, kind of overarching rules that, uh, uh, that I like to tell people. And then another question I get a lot is about timing, especially when you're doing a meal of how do you, um, you know, if, especially if you're doing a big meal, holiday meals, you know, and my, my uh, mother-in-law comes over and she'll say, it, it seems like every like you're not doing anything. It's, you know, and, it's like, for one, I, I prep as much as, uh, as I can ahead of time. And then I think about cooking times. Okay, if we're going to eat at, you know, four o'clock for a, a holiday dinner, and I know that my potatoes are going to take uh, an hour, I'm going to start them at, you know, two thirty, three o'clock. If I know my vegetables are going to take a half an hour, I start them, you know, at 3.30. And, you know, my meat, if it's a, you know, roast or something, I just think about how long that's going to take. Give yourself a little bit of wiggle room and just kind of plan backwards. Um, so I'd say those are, those are probably the top three. Great. All right. Oh, I like this one. Cutting seems to take up so much time when preparing meals. Do you have suggestions or resources on how I can get better? Well, uh, on terms of getting better with cutting, um, for one, I mean, again, again, the internet's such a wonderful place and, uh, and the flip side of that as well. But, uh, YouTube. I mean, you could, you could, you know, you can really see anybody uh, on YouTube and uh, it's especially a lot of professionals that actually, you know, uh, quality uh, information on how to actually do that. Um, you know, how to, how to do different uh, knife cuts and, and knife skills. Um, but I will say that one of the most important things is having a sharp knife and I mean, good quality knives to begin with. Um, and I know it's, you know, what happens a lot of times in home kitchens is you buy a knife set and it's great. And then it just, the, the, the edges started going and you don't really know how to sharpen a knife. And um, let's see, everybody can see, everybody can just see your screen still, right? The, the slide? They can see you as well. Oh, okay, okay, good. So, um, so I'll show this thing, this little thing right here is, uh, it's like a drag through sharpener. And this thing literally suctions down on your counter and you can drag your knife right through to uh, sharpen it. And, it. and it has like the, the little, little V there that it's not necessarily gonna work for every single knife, but most knives, especially one that maybe hasn't been sharpened in a while, these things, this was one that my mother-in-law bought me and, and she, she loves getting me kitchen gadgets and most of them are you know, not so great, but uh, uh, this was one of the good ones that uh, if, you know, we, we like chefs like using sharpening stones, but that takes a little bit more time, takes a little bit more skill. So these kind of things are really great for that. Uh, and then speaking of which, I even, I got a couple knives here that, um, I like small, like smaller, you know, they call these kind of Santoku style knives that are not as big as a chef knife. Uh, this one's probably, I think six or seven inches long. Um, and then a lot of knives on the heel part right here will have that, that bevel that comes from the top, a lot of French knives, right? And the problem with those are when you're, when you go to sharpen them, it, you can't really sharpen that end part. So then you, you, you get to the point where if you sharpen it so much, you're not actually cutting things the whole way through with your knife. And that, that's certainly frustrating. Um, and then the other part about um, with kind of that prepping and, and cutting is thinking, what can you cross utilize? So if you're, you know, if you're cutting onions and peppers for whatever you're making tonight, are you, do you, do you know what you're making tomorrow? Is there, you know, mm -hmm. can you knock that out at the same time while you already have your, you have your knife out, your cutting board, you already have the product out. Um, and, and really that's how, as a professional chef, that's how we, we have to operate is 
how do we, you know, streamline any prep that we're doing um, by, you know, looking at not just looking at the current meal we're working on, but looking at the next few days and how, you know, if we're working on one thing, let's do it all. And, you know, just to streamline that process. Chef Tim, can you, do you know the name brand of the knife sharpener you mentioned? Uh, this one is Sharp Shark. Uh, and and uh, my mother-in-law is all about QVC, so I'm, I, I would be willing to bet this is where it came from. But uh, right. there's plenty of companies that make these type of drag throughs. Again, this one suctions to the counter. I've seen plenty that are just kind of handheld that have a, a guard that goes over your uh, your knuckles. Um, but uh, uh, there's again, there's plenty, and and these things are not not expensive either. You could probably find them for ten, twenty bucks uh, easily. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. All right. What is your favorite meal to prepare and why? So chefs get asked this question all the time. And surprisingly, I still haven't come up with a wonderful answer. Uh, <laughs> but because I, you know, I, I, for one, I, the first thing I wanted to say to this is something that I've never made before. And because, you know, we love trying new things. And, um, uh, and one thing I love doing is if, if I'm, if I go somewhere and I, I have something that I'm intrigued by and I think, okay, how do I, how do I duplicate this or how do I take this idea and, and turn it into something else? Um, I'll mention one. So I'm in a, a program called the Culinary uh, Enrichment and Innovation Program through the Culinary Institute of America where I went to school. Um, that, and it's also with, uh, with other professional chefs. And there's been a few modules where we got to go to the, a few of the CIA campuses and, San Antonio and Napa, and we're in, in San Antonio at a restaurant uh, called Supper, and the chef comes out and is talking to us, and he says that his number one uh, menu item is quail. And I'm like, how is that possible that quail is your number one menu item? Because it's, quail is great, but it's not, you know, the, 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 the popular thing that everybody goes for. It's not right. chicken or steak or, you know, those kind of things, right? So, so then he sends it out, and I realize why. It was a smoked and then fried like uh, quail. So think, think fried chicken, that crispy, juicy fried chicken, but they smoked it first uh, and it was just amazing. So, so I have that and I think I'm absolutely stealing that idea. Uh, that was <laughs> one of my favorite lines from one of my culinary school instructors was know a good idea when you steal one. Uh, Cause in the chef business, that's, that's kind of all we do is steal other people's ideas and put them together to make something else basically. Um, but we took that and we took chicken thighs uh, smoke them or we brine them uh, smoke them and then did that kind of fried thing that, that Thomas Keller does that, you know where we you know buttermilk flour buttermilk flour and fried them and these things are just absolutely amazing uh, and then on the simple side of things of one of my favorite things to prepare is because one of my favorite things to eat are tacos I love tacos you can I mean who doesn't love tacos but uh, you can you know they're so it's such a versatile thing that you can you know, you, you take a tortilla and there's so many different kinds of tortillas and you can, any kind of meat or, you know, mushrooms or beans or, you know, whatever, you know, a, a lot of times we'd say, okay, what's in the fridge? What's in the pantry? Let's make something out of it. And usually tacos can, can be done with many things you have laying around. Wonderful. I remember whenever you made the, um, I think it was two years ago, you did a, a smoked meal at homecoming that was super popular. It was the first time I saw anything smoked on campus. It was great. Uh, yeah, what ingredients are always in your kitchen? Oh, let's see. Um, I'd say the top of the list uh, that differentiate, you know, that not necessarily everybody uses is kosher salt. That's one thing that chefs, uh, you know, the, the iodized salt, the table salt that's in a shaker, like it, Get, get rid of that. We don't need that stuff. But either kosher salt or sea salt that has, you know, has a, a little bit of coarseness to it. You can get the really coarse stuff that's just, you know, you break your break your tooth on, uh, unless it's in a grinder. But um, the nice thing about kosher salt is is you can feel it. So when you're seasoning something, you know, if you're pour, if you're using a salt shaker and you're pouring salt out of it, you can see a little bit, but it's so fine that you could really either put too much or not nearly enough. But uh, kosher salt. Um, is you know it, it, it just makes it that much that much better and that much easier to do it properly. Um, some other things you know really good olive oil. Um, being that I love 
tacos so much and and we always have salsa like all the time we have hummus all the time um and then you know you always gotta have the staples of onions we always have onions i we usually do red onions uh that are always in there um but those are those are kind of some of the, the top ones for sure right if i remember correctly then the next question is sort of a follow-up to it especially for um maybe some of our younger graduates who are on the call what kitchen items like what types of tools do you think are most essential, especially for those who are building their first home kitchen? So, uh, like I mentioned about the knives already, a good knife, you know, and you don't need a, a good big giant knife set, right? Especially when you're first starting out, you need maybe one knife like the, the ones I showed that, you know, a little bit smaller version of a chef knife, uh, a serrated knife for bread or, you know, anything like that, and maybe a small paring knife in a peeler uh, to start with, you know, and, and uh, it's funny, I had... Um, one of my, my chefs in school, uh, Shirley Chang, an amazing chef. She, she really started, the, the CIA has a campus in Singapore that she kind of, she almost started on her own, you know, you know really led the, the charge in starting that. But um, what she always said was with, you know, especially with Asian cooking, uh, she says, we have one knife, which is, you know, that, that kind of that traditional cleaver and one spoon, which is a ladle. So it's like, we, you know, French chefs and a lot of other chefs they have these giant knife kits with all these different things, but they're all, they're all blades, right? They, a lot of them do the, the same thing, even though they might be a little bit different. So uh, start with a few good knives and it doesn't have to be like crazy expensive or whatever, but you know, you see those knife sets that are like the, the old Ginsu knives that are everything serrated. Like, no, no, that's, you know, those, those, a serrated knife has its purpose, but it's not for everything. Um, let's see, a few good pans. Um, uh, and one thing that some people seem to, seem to always want is nonstick pans. Like everyone wants all nonstick pans. Nonstick pans are great and they have their, their purposes for doing eggs and, you know, things like that. But um, don't be afraid of just a nice, you know, stainless steel pan or a, a lot of times with pans, think of, of all clad is, is a great brand. Um, I think, I don't know if they're still made in Cannonsburg, but I, I know they used to be and used to be able to go to their second sales. And I, a lot of the pans I still use today when I was starting off as a, as a broke college graduate, uh, starting, you know, they, I would go to these second sales where there's a scratch here or, you know, a little imperfection here, but they still work fine. Um, and all clad, most of them are, are stainless steel that are, uh, but have aluminum uh, clad in the, in the base, which distributes the heat better. So, um, so that's pretty important. Uh, heat resistant spatula. Uh, Cause I've, I mean, I've done them myself plenty of times where I didn't have one handy and I thought I'll just use this other spatula and then it melts right in your pan and then gets in your food and everything. Uh, so that's a good one. Um, and then if you are using nonstick pans, make sure that you have the right utensils for those. Because if you're using a nonstick pan and you go in there with a metal, you know, spatula, there's a good chance you're just going to scratch it up. And then what's the point if, if it's not nonstick anymore? Um, and then one other one is a, is a good blender or food processor. I actually have, uh, I wouldn't say we use it all the time, but it's nice to have that um, it might have been a, a wedding on our wedding registry or something like that but it's a KitchenAid uh, combo of a blender and a food processor. And I know now there's all those Ninja kitchen systems and all that kind of, there's Vitamix blenders, which are great, but they're probably way too expensive for, uh, uh, for someone starting out. But um, you know, th those, are, those are some of the top ones. A good cutting board. Uh, I, I, one thing that drives me nuts is when I see people cutting on those, um, for one, cutting on glass. Like a glass is not a cutting board, even though they sell glass cutting boards. Uh, and then two, those, those really flimsy, uh, those cutting boards that are just like, you know, a, 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 a piece of plastic, like get a, get a nice wooden, you know, end grain cutting board. Uh, and that'll, it'll, it'll make all the difference and, and make sure that your cutting board is stable on your counter too. Cause you'll see a lot of those, well, you know, where they're wobbling around. And if that happens, put a wet towel underneath, uh, you know, while you're working on it, it'll keep it from moving around. So because I fall into both of those categories when you're describing cutting boards, can I ask why no glass? Well, what, I don't, I don't know why, I, my question would be why glass? Like it, you, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to, um, it just doesn't make any sense. You're going to dull your knife for one, because there's, uh, no no. there's no give in glass, you know? Um, and then it kind of, things slide a little bit more and it's noisy and I, I don't know, I just, I, I, I never... I never got that one. I, I would take the, the flimsy plastic over the glass any day. <laughs> I have both if you ever want it. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we have another question coming from the chat. Danny Lynn? 
Okay, so Jim wants to know, what are your favorite Food Network shows and chefs? Hmm. So I, 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 could, I could probably speak for most chefs and say that we don't really watch a lot of Food Network. Um, oh, wow. You, you know, I, I, a lot of Food Network chefs seem to, um, you know, they're, they're entertainers. They're not necessarily chefs, although I've, I've uh, I, I certainly have, have grown to respect a lot of them. One of my wife's favorite shows is The Kitchen. Uh, which has uh, Jeffrey Zakarian, which who he is a legit amazing chef, uh, and I act, you know anything he says, the, go go for it. He's he's abs he's great, you know. And a lot of the other ones on that show too are, um, even though it's a little bit quirky and fun, and I'm not really sure what their background is, the, the stuff they do on there is pretty good. Um, let's see, my, I'll, I'll tell you my least favorite uh, Food Network chef, and that's Bobby Flay. Uh, I don't I don't know too many chefs that really uh, uh, like him. I actually had a, I went to culinary school with a guy who worked for him and. And he um, he agreed that uh, you know he's just he's just not not a, not too great of a guy you know it doesn't mean he can't cook but um, let's see um, and then uh, for I, I was getting into and listening to some podcasts with this guy named Carl Ruiz who was uh, he did a lot of stuff on like guys grocery games and and mm -hmm. and I learned a little bit more about Guy Fieri uh, you know through through listening to him and even though Guy Fieri is that kind of like. I don't know, circus sideshow, like, you know, <laughs> giant burger, like, you know, all the, the, the crazy stuff. And, the, and there's certainly a place for all that stuff. Uh, from what I've heard, he is an amazing, uh, uh, not only is he, you know, a talented, awesome chef, but like um, the wildfires in California, because of him, he, he's, they, they, I don't know how many meals they serve. Uh, and then whenever this, the whole COVID thing started, um, he raised something like $20 million to help uh, cooks and chefs who are, you know, out of work. Um, so even, even though he might not be the fanciest guy in the world, I, I, I certainly give kudos to him. That's very Ducanable of you. <laughs> I'm with you. All right. Can you explain some of the fancy cooking terms that are often used on cooking shows? Sure. So uh, there were some on this, you know, submitted earlier. Well, and one was a roux, um, which uh, a roux is, is basically is if you boil it down as simple as you can, it's flour and fat that are used to thicken something. So it, uh, if you're in a pinch and trying to do something quickly, and say you're making you're making gravy, uh, and you're at Thanksgiving dinner, and uh, uh, you you roast your turkey, you take your your carcass, your innards, whatever, and you make a little stock out of them. You can literally just take a, some canola oil with some flour whisked in it and pour that into your boiling stock and it'll thicken it up to make gravy. Um, but uh, really a, a roux generally is butter and flour and it's usually cooked down. So, you know, whether it's just cooked in a pan uh, and it can be cooked to varying degrees. So there's like a blonde roux, a, a brown roux, a dark brown roux, uh, like gumbo is famous for having a, like a dark brown roux. So uh, the, the reason gumbo is so so dark and rich is because they really cook the roux out to brown the butter, brown the flour, and it really kind of adds depth to the flavor, uh, but it takes a lot more time to do that. Um, when we're doing roux um, at Duquesne, we, we do big batches where we'll do in a big, um, you know, a big roasting pan where we'll take um, butter and flour and mix it together and we'll throw it in the oven and just let it kind of cook down in the oven, periodically stir it, Usually it's done on the stove. It, if you're doing it at home, that would be the easiest way to do it. But uh, let's see, bolognese was on there, bolognese sauce. So um, in the American sense, bolognese sauce is marinara with ground beef added to it. But is that real bolognese? No, so real bolognese from, from Italy is basically just means in the, in the style of Bologna, which um, uh, their base there, which isn't normal for, for what we think of as marinara or, you know, red sauce, which has onions, which is normal, but has celery and carrots, which usually that's kind of, that's mirepoix, which is another, another term, uh, which is kind of the basis for a ton of French cooking and stocks and, and soups and sauces. And mirepoix is two parts onion, one part celery, one part carrots, usually either diced up or chunked up. Um, but, uh, but anyways, bolognese, um, uh, just like so many Italian terms, you hear of caprese, you hear of uh, um, uh, Florentine and all this, and it's just all about what, what's done in the region where that's named after. But the crazy thing about um, countries like that, you know, Italy, you know, old, old world countries, Italy and, and, you know, Germany and England, 
things could vary so much even within the region because from town to town, it depends on what's available. So, but anyways, uh, bolognese um, traditionally, uh, again, has carrots, celery, usually some kind of slow cooked meat. So it might be beef, might be pork, it might be rabbit or whatever is, you know, whatever is available. And then usually tomatoes, herbs, uh, and then usually served with uh, a nice pasta. Um, let's see, compote was on the list. Uh, compote is something that gets uh, uh, kind of bastardized pretty easily, or it's just one of those terms that anything kind of, you know, kind of fruity and sweet and, and uh, has a little bit of viscosity to it, you could just call it compote. Uh, but generally that's, that's what it really should be, is something that's fruit, you know, a sweet, um, uh, cooked down, um, a lot of times with berries or other fruits. And then it could be a topping for a cheesecake or a savory dish or served with brie or, or something like that. Uh, amuse bouche or amuse. Um, so that's something that is, uh, uh, the, the whole idea is that it amuses your palate. So it's, it's usually a one bite thing that you have, uh, usually the beginning of kind of a fancy meal. If you go to one of those really nice restaurants that has, you know, multiple courses, um, you know, any of those Michelin star places that are really high end, they'll just bring out, you know, one bite, either set it in front of you, hand it to you. Uh, and, and it's something that's just supposed to kind of in, intrigue your palate and amuse the palate to get ready for, you know, for what else is to come. Um, so those were, those were some of the other ones, unless there was any other on the, the list or the chat that anyone was asking about. Nope. All right. Uh, and I, I think that this is, I know that this is our last pre-submitted question. What's your perfect day eating out in Pittsburgh, either in the city or in the close vicinity, assuming that COVID and traffic are not issues? Yeah, so uh, for one, I, I wish I was uh, a little bit better, um, better suited to answer this question because I live in Greensburg for one. So, you know, I'm about, <laughs> I, I, you know, so I commute into town every day and my, you know, my wife, my family, everyone's here. So we don't eat in town as much, nearly as much as I would like to. Um, but with that being said, um, breakfast, it's been a while since I've been there, but DeLuca's just that yeah. kind of old, old diner, their bre big breakfast, bur breakfast burritos, like one of my favorite uh, breakfast things. And, and uh, I love getting them there. Um, let's see, lunch, uh, gaucho, uh, Perea, you know, Argentinian, um, uh, you know, barbecue and, and grilled things, which used to be down on the strip. And then they just, uh, they just moved and, and reopened in the location uh, uh, where Six Pen Kitchen, which was part of Eaton Park Hospitality Group, my company, uh, which we had the restaurant there in, in the cultural district. So I believe they just opened during all this craziness, uh, you know, a week or two ago, I'm, I would imagine they're, they may be shut down now with uh, the latest restrictions. But, um, but it's, it's a really neat concept where you go in, if you haven't been there, you go in, and you just order at the counter and they have all these, you know, all their menu listed right there. You order whatever you want, uh, you pay, and then you go sit down, they bring it out to you. So it's kind of casual, but the food is absolutely amazing. Uh, let's see. Um, Bird on the Run in East Liberty. There's two places in East Liberty that I'll mention. So Bird on the Run is, uh, let's see, Muddy Waters Oyster House, Bird on the Run, and Kahuna, like Poke Bowls. It's all the same owner, same chef, uh, Adam Kasenek. And I actually played high school football with him. We grew up together and um, uh, he, he, he's turned into an amazing chef, but bird on the run is um, think of a Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich, but it's bigger and juicier and crispier and tastier. And it's just like, it, it's that to the next level, but it's very simple. It's, you know, it's pickles and chicken. And I think, he, I don't know if he has a sauce on there, but, and again, it's kind of that counter service where you just go up order. They have some alcoholic drinks there and, and, you know, some good fries and some other stuff, but you go up, order, sit down, comes out in a few minutes, and it's just, you know, absolutely amazing. Uh, and then the other one very close to that in East Liberty is, is, is a smaller chain uh, restaurant that, that I, I get intrigued by, and it's Chula, which is a, like, a, like a fast, casual Indian, um, uh, you know, concept. But they have really, uh, you know, real tandoori ovens where they're doing the naan bread. They have, uh, you know, a ton of really good, you know, chutneys and, and toppings for all their stuff. Uh, and we've actually, our company's been in conversation with them of how we can maybe do some kind of partnership. And I feel that, especially in Pittsburgh, we don't really have a lot of great Indian options. So I'm not saying that that's a wonderful, authentic Indian option, um, but it is, uh, it, it checks the boxes that it's, it's fresh, it's tasty, uh, it's a cool kind of vibe in there. Um, and you can customize things however you want. Um, let's see, for dinner, unfortunately, my, my answer that was always for this 
just closed because of this, this mess that we're in. And that would have been union standard, uh, which was in the standard trust building. And uh, another friend of mine, Derek Stevens, I worked with him at the, the Duquesne club years ago. Um, he opened up this restaurant and he, he worked for big burrito at 11 for a long time. And he, you know, uh, really amazing, talented, awesome guy. Uh, and he had this, um, this huge restaurant union standard, um, that was really a large footprint for a, for a Pittsburgh restaurant. And unfortunately he was one of many casualties to all this mess, but I don't know where he's going to end up, but wherever he ends up, go there because he is, he is the real deal. Uh, and again, he's just a great guy too. So, um, another place that it's temporarily, temporarily closed and, and not that I'm not, not that I'm plugging all my friends here, but you know, as chefs, we, we all stick together. Um, but uh, Superior Motors in Braddock and, you know, Kevin Seuss is the chef there. Again, I, I worked with him back at the Duquesne Club as well a long time ago, and we've always kept in touch. And um, what he's done there is pretty amazing. He did the, this whole record-breaking Kickstarter campaign and he brought a restaurant to Braddock where there's nothing in Braddock. And he's literally right across from the steel mill. Uh, he's actually in the, in the, basically in the bottom level of John Fetterman's house. <laughs> so he has... They, and it's called Superior Motors because it was it was a uh, car dealership. It was you know one a very early car dealership, and it's a it's a cool space. and And Kevin's food is is uh, it's it's out there. It's it's different, but it's recognizable and it's tasty. and And he certainly has a a very unique way of of looking at things and creating things. So, uh, and then for dessert, uh, I got a again I got to plug another friend, and that's Chad Townsend from Millie's Homemade Ice Cream. And Millie's, we, we partner with at Duquesne. We've used them for homecoming events. Uh, we had a pop-up for, you know, about a semester in the student union. Um, and again, Chad, Chad was a guy who uh, was, a, he was a chef for Kevin Sousa at uh, uh, Salt of the Earth, whenever he had that. He's, he spent time at Michelin restaurants in Europe. And uh, he was, he just, I think got kind of, I don't know if he got sick of cooking, but he just, he just you know, it's, it's a grind to be a chef for sure. Um, you know, especially when you're working in the restaurant world where you're working, you know, all the weekends, all the late nights and all those. And him and his wife started Millie's Homemade the Ice Cream, which was Millie's is, is his grandma's name. Uh, and their ice cream, it's, you know, it's legit. It is the, it is real ice cream, uses real ingredients, uh, you know, very seasonal depending on what's available. Uh, and they're spreading all over the place. You can get them, I think they stock at Giant Eagle and some other stores. They have a shops in Shadyside and Market Square and they built a new uh, a new facility I think in Homestead to produce everything but um, but th that for dessert that's that's definitely my go-to. I bet a weekend with your friends is a lot of fun. <laughs> do nothing but eat. Uh, I know we've got one last question that came through the chat Danny Lynn. Actually this is uh, just my question. <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> What is your biggest pet peeve as far as um, like newer employees that are in the kitchen? Hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sure I have a good uh, a, a good one for this. That that, that I, I always you know I, I know there's certain things that I'll I'll tell people I'll say you need to understand that this is something that I'm going to harp about you know all, all the time and I I can't think of any specific examples but uh, all I want is for people to for one, want to be there, you know, be excited about what they're doing and, and just put out a great product, uh, no matter what you're working on. If, you know, and, and, and a job like mine at, at Duquesne, we'll do anything from 3000 box lunches <laughs> to, uh, to, you know, nice dinners for President Gormley and, and guests that he's entertaining to the Duquesne Society to, you know, a, a anything and everything in between. But it's just whatever you're doing, make sure that you're putting all you can into it and having the, the best product you can. Um, and, and, and that's all. And, and one thing I always tell, uh, especially young culinarians, if, you know, if we have students that come through to, to work with us or someone that's, you know, you know, early on in their careers is, is just say, be a sponge, you know, I think that goes with anything that you're trying to get better at. It's just absorb everything you possibly can. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the more that you can, you can grasp from anyone you're dealing with um, is the better, better you're going to be. And I always tell people a story of when, when I was back at the Duquesne club and I started off right out of culinary school as a line cook, which at the time was not the normal, uh, path there. They were a little bit understaffed. Normally you would start off kind of in a salad pantry or garmanger, which means the, the cold food side where they would do, 
you know, cold appetizers and, and uh, you know, the cold salads and things like that. Um, but I got right on the hotline and there was a guy who was in culinary school that was working in garment and um, every time I had free time, I'd finish whatever prep I was doing and I'd go over there and I'd say, what do you, what are you working on? What do you need help with? And, and uh, I got to the point where uh, every time I'd walk over, he would just say, well, what are you doing? What are you, what are you working on? You know, because he knew I was going to ask, but, but that and uh, me asking that and me absorbing all that stuff helped me just climb the ladder rapidly because I was versatile and I could do a lot of different things. That's fantastic. All right, I'm just gonna double check what, yep, looks like we have cleared the chat and I know we've gone through the list of um, pre-submitted questions. Chef Tim, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks for making time uh, in the midst of what I know is a really busy time for you on campus preparing for our students to return. Of course, we also wanna thank our alumni for joining us this evening and we hope that you'll join us again for future events. As always, our events are listed on our website. Thank you to, of course, Chef Tim, Parker's Dining Services, Danny Lynn for assisting the event tonight, uh, my colleague Audrey Tierney who also works in our office who assisted prepare uh, for, this e for this evening's event and for all of our online events lately, uh, Sarah Sperry who assisted uh, and provided backup support, and of course our Alumni Board of Governors for helping us always come up with creative ideas for pro new programming. We're pleased to announce another way that you can stay in the know Download our TASEL app for a full list of alumni events, as well as information on joining one of our many volunteer groups. The TASEL app makes you immediately aware of volunteer opportunities that are available to our alumni, and you can also use it to search for other alumni who are using the app. And finally, I wanna remind you about a new opportunity available to our alumni community called Dukes Connect. Dukes Connect is a networking platform for our alumni and students. You can seek and offer help to and from other members of our Duquesne community and you can join that now at dukesconnect.com. I wanna thank everyone for jo joining us tonight and hopefully we will see you again sometime soon. Thank you again, have a great night all. Thanks everybody, it's been a pleasure.